So, first of all, a happy new year. We have the feeling that 2022 is going to be awesome and already now some interesting things have happened in this still young year. For one, we have NASA's announcement that the ISS will be kept alive until at least the year 2030. Wow, that is quite a sudden change of heart. So let's analyze why this could be and what this would mean for the future of NASA space programs. Also, is it a very good or a very bad idea? And regarding the James Webb Space Telescope, it looks as if everything went well, the sunshade has almost been fully deployed, and now let's look at what's happening and what the next step will be for that important piece of hardware. We all remember that not too long ago there was talk about decommissioning the ISS as early as 2024 when the Artemis program was in high gear in the previous US administration. Back then NASA director Jim Bridenstine wanted to commit all resources for the new Artemis program, understandably since that program will of course not be cheap. In fact, NASA's planned return to the moon will need a lot of allocated funding, as much as NASA can spare from anywhere else. NASA currently has a budget of around $25 billion annually, which is relatively high as compared to the inflation-adjusted yearly amounts of the last decades. Now sure, it is not anywhere near the budget peak of 1967 and 1968, but we know that back then NASA had a really high budget of over 4% of the total federal budget for political reasons, namely in order to beat the Soviet Union to the moon. After that, the budget declined and now since a few years it has started rising again because of the new Artemis program. And the reason why there hasn't been enough money to build a moon base after the Apollo program is of course the horrendously expensive and useless space shuttle program and the International Space Station. Because instead of maintaining their lead in space, some not-so-smart US politicians chose to concentrate on low Earth orbit instead. Until 2011, the space shuttle program cost a whopping $200 billion, that is more than the around $170 billion for the entire Apollo program, inflation adjusted to $2022. And then the International Space Station cost over $150 billion until 2010, inflation adjusted, so basically we are talking $350 billion for low Earth orbit flights and a low Earth orbit station, twice as much as the entire Apollo program. The decision to retire the entire ISS as soon as possible by 2024 would have, in my opinion, been an excellent one. Why? Because maintaining the ISS isn't exactly cheap. The numbers that one can find for the running costs of NASA for this giant assemblage of tin can cylinders is from at least $1 billion annually, with some other sources citing as much as $4 billion, which seems excessive, but a number of about $2 billion annually seems realistic. Imagine that around 2 billion annually. This is 2 SLSs annually or 22 Falcon Heavy reusable launches. For the yearly operational costs of the ISS alone, NASA could easily build a moon base using Falcon Heavy's around 20 metric tons of payload to lunar transfer orbit. So maintaining the ISS drains a lot of resources away from lunar exploration. Why then does NASA suddenly want to keep the ISS? Well, politics of course. You can be sure that every time politics gets involved in space matters, stupid decisions are being made. Instead of fully focusing on the moon and committing as many resources as possible to achieve a manned moon landing as early as possible, it seems that the Biden administration chose to prolong the ISS lifespan to at least 2030. Why? Well, according to some sources, Biden had a heated phone call with Putin on December 30th and just one day later, we get the announcement of prolonging ISS operations until at least 2030. 
And we know that Russia's relations to the US are deteriorating at a rapid pace, while the Russians are allying themselves more and more with China. China, meanwhile, is in the process of building their own new space station, the new Tiangong station, which will be finished in the next one to two years. While that station is considerably smaller than the ISS, with 110 cubic meters of pressurized living space versus the ISS's 930 cubic meters, China and hence Russia would be the only nations operating a space station if the US would decommission the ISS in 2024. From the perspective of the US, that might give them a tactical advantage in low Earth orbit. Of course, we know that this line of thinking is completely wrong. One starship, repeat, one single SpaceX starship, will soon already offer more interior pressurized volume than the entire ISS. Operational and maintenance costs will be orders of magnitude lower than for the entire ISS with that solution. And there are other commercial space station solutions on the horizon, such as Axiom Space Station, that will certainly be a lot cheaper than the ISS. Or we also have Nanorex with their own space station plans. Then of course Blue Origin and Sierra Space's Orbital Reef Space Station. So it's not that there aren't many commercial options available. It would be entirely possible to decommission the ISS by 2024 and replace it with a far, far cheaper commercial space station. But why isn't the US doing that? Well, of course, you have guessed it. The American ISS modules were of course built by Boeing and Boeing of course also wants to fly their Starliner to the ISS because the whole purpose of the Starliner was to fly to the ISS. So if there is no ISS anymore, Boeing is unhappy and many other old space companies are unhappy and if they are unhappy then the lobbyists are unhappy and if the lobbyists are unhappy then the politicians in Washington are unhappy. So instead of replacing that old money pit called ISS and replace it with something efficient and lean, it's being kept alive way longer than would make sense. A lot of funds will be diverted away from the Artemis program so that NASA will only be able to land humans on the moon earliest by 2026 and more realistically by 2028. Meanwhile, China is speeding up their moon program and might actually land on the moon before the USA and allies, which would put the US at a serious strategic disadvantage. That is why the decision to sustain the ISS through 2030 might seem at first like a good decision, but in fact it's really not a good decision. Thank God the US has SpaceX, if not, they would be so totally insanely screwed regarding human spaceflight, it's, it's just mind-boggling. We should all hope that SpaceX will restore the US presence on the moon, where the US should have already been since 50 years, if intelligent people would have been in power in the early 70s. SpaceX will restore what apparently the US can't because of politics or lobbying, but most likely because of both. And please subscribe to this channel if you like space news with an added dose of sometimes sarcastic commentary and you can be sure that here we don't shy away from space related political analysis. Thanks a lot in advance. In much better and happier news, the James Webb Space Telescope is progressing as planned and is on its way to the Sun-Earth Lagrange Point L2, where it will arrive in about 3 weeks time. Now, we mentioned in one of our previous videos that this Lagrange point is not free from solar illumination as L2 is too far away from Earth to be completely covered by the Earth's shadow. Therefore, a solar shade is needed in order to allow the instruments to cool down to under 50 Kelvin of temperature so that super high sensitivity infrared astronomy can happen. Now, a really important milestone has been achieved and the tennis court sized sunshade has been deployed although it is not yet tensioned. This process will begin on January 3rd earliest because the scientists controlling the process from Earth, they want to quote, optimize Webb's power systems while learning more about how the observatory behaves in space, end quote. The tensioning process will take at least two days to complete, so by January 5th it should normally be done. The sunshield is actually an incredibly complex piece of hardware. 
It consists of five layers of a material called Kapton. Each layer is coated with aluminium and the sun facing side of the two hottest layers, designated layer 1 and 2, also have a doped silicon or treated silicon coating in order to reflect the sun's heat back into space. The sun shield deployment itself relied on 107 membrane release devices, every one of which had to work for the sun shield to extend correctly. And fortunately, all 107 did release successfully, as NASA stated on December 25th. So it's looking really good for the James Webb Space Telescope, and it will be incredible when we see the first light of this new space telescope, which is estimated to take place in about three months, after the telescope has sufficiently cooled down and all systems have been tested to work flawlessly. We can expect many groundbreaking discoveries, and who knows, Maybe the JWST will even detect signatures from exoplanets that can only arise due to the presence of life. That would be a really worthy discovery for such a groundbreaking instrument. So the whole team here at To The Future again wishes you a good start into the year 2022. We have the feeling that it will be an absolutely excellent year for spaceflight, especially because we can expect the first Starship orbital launch this year. And until this happens, we say on to the future!